All right. So what I'm going to talk about is, is, is um, the challenge that I, th I think about a lot is how do we go from educating people like in this room or even 70 people, dozens of people, to educating thousands or tens of thousands or millions? Because this is, um, and how can we bring rigorous entrepreneurship education to places like the Middle East where they have a demographic of people who are Um, and by the way, there aren't a lot of great educators in the, in the region as well to be able to provide that education. What about some of you from India, you know, um, China? How do we provide high quality entrepreneurship education at scale? Um, and it's not, it's not as easy as, as um, doing it for Java and other things. Because um, as you know, if we did Java or math or, or you know, some new language, it would be the same for everybody in this room. But, Entrepreneurship requires customization. So, um, so this is something I put in there that, you know, it's not just one form of entrepreneurship, by the way. It, it's, it's customized to different regions of the world. So in the United States, we have a situation in the past where it, it's been a stable government. Um, and it still is going to be a stable government, just to be clear. <laughs> A stable government and it was predictable and then you have bottoms up kind of entrepreneurship but you still have support from tops down. Um, in other places, uh, if you think of China, it's more, much more the government plays a much bigger role to have things move down. Then you move to places like the Middle East or Africa where you have governments that are unpredictable. Do you just give up? No, the, the point is that there's a great book by a guy named Chris Schroeder called Startup Rising where in these places, entrepreneurship is primarily bottoms up. So in a place like China, arguably, it's going to be tops down, it's going to have a heavy influence. In, in, in the Middle East, it's bottoms up. In the United States, there's this interesting mix between them. In Europe, there is no entrepreneurship, so we don't have to worry about that. <laughs> that was a joke. That was. Wait, is anyone, we have any Europeans left here? Ah, oh, yes. Sorry. <laughs> you, you, used, you used to be European. <laughs> so, so just to, as we go through this, you know, it, it, you think about your regions, you have to customize what we're doing. You can't just take full stop what we're doing here and transport it there again, like you could for if it was Java. You have to think about you know, what's the, what's the, what's the on, uh, environment for the entrepreneur? What role do universities play? Um, and we'll talk about this later, about universities. Are they, are they economic development arms of the government, or are they truly educational institutions that are just liberally educating, I shouldn't say liberally, educating human beings? Um, what role does the government play? What role do corporations play? You look at places like um, Morocco or Saudi Arabia, the, you know, Aramco or OSEPE, they play a dominant role in what happens there. If you look at, uh, in Korea, the corporations play a very strong role, not quite as dominant. And then what's the presence or lack of presence of risk capital and how is it regulated? So we are at a place now where entrepreneurship, the demand for it is, is, is going up. Um, we have a situation where the government wants it, um, society is uh, um, accepting it more, and so now all of a sudden we have this opportunity. How are we going to take advantage of that? So how do we do it quickly, effectively, and efficiently? That means, you know, cost effectively and, and with high quality. So. Um, so this is, this is what I, you know, came back to MIT and, and uh, you know, Erdine and I were working on this. How do we get MIT motivated for this? Because this is a big task. Can MIT do it? And the answer is, is that we believe that MIT should play a big role in this, not the only role by any stretch of the imagination. But it can because we have um, a standardized approach to teaching entrepreneurship that's that combines theory and practice. It's, it's, it's rigorous, but it's also open that you could make additions. If you come along and say, hey, you know, 
there's, there's a step missing or the framework isn't quite right, we're more than willing to adjust that. We're not a business, we're an we're a, a, a institution that's promoting knowledge. If a better answer comes along, it's an open source uh, system as far as we're concerned. Um, so then you combine that with the platform of edX, the ability to produce MOOCs, and you, are, you understand this very, very well at a visceral level. That, though, the combination of those two things opens up all kinds of opportunities, but those two are not enough. But nobody else kind of has those two at this point. Um, so we believe that we need to take a leadership role. So what I'm going to talk about is, you know, what I call the triple triangle approach. And, and to teach entrepreneurship, we've talked about, you know, you need the four H's, the, the, the heart, the head, you know, the heart to have the spirit, the head to be able to know what to do, the, the hands to be able to do it, and the home to have a community. And so when we look at education, we need to, we need to provide those four H's. And inspiration is part of it. Now, people in other areas say that's not really part of an educator's job. I believe in entrepreneurship, it's very important. And I think all of you understand that too. There's someone this weekend said, yeah, and came up to me and said, I have an idea. And I said, I, I, you know, and one of his friends said, that's not a good idea. And he said, you said, Bill, that it's the spirit of a pirate. And I said, you're right, Joe, <laughs> go, go for it. Um, but this idea of inspiration and then having the skill set to do it, you know, that's the spirit of a pirate, skills of a, of, a, of a Navy SEAL, and then adapting it to the context and then creating domain expertise within industries as well. So there's, there's this kind of general level, but then there's specificity that needs to happen because all entrepreneurship isn't the same. The last thing that, 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 that's kind of not up here is clear, but is clear now as we go through it, and what we were talking about last Friday is the need for community. And this is what, what, what Sally and Rachel are working on. But let's go through this. Let's ask questions. So the, 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 the one at the bottom is, how do we create this kind of um, core content? Do we, have a la we don't have a laser pointer, do we? So, we're going to go through this, this, what we have right now, which is many people take the MOOC and then they kind of go up to a select few who come to here at MIT or it could be someplace else, or they could be regional boot camps or whatever, and then that's the triangle. That's the, this is the one that we kind of understand today, and I'm going to break that down. So then I'm going to get into how do we customize that, and then how do you, the third triangle is how we connect with the rest of the world. Okay? So, in the future, I, the way that I think this is, if we're going to do millions of people, you know, is we have, Matt, we have these, the MOOCs. And the MOOCs could be customized to a specific area, but right now we have hundreds of thousands of people. How many people have taken it now? Do you know? Is that all? It hasn't gone up very much. Well, we archived 101 and 102 for the past year, so. Yeah. You're killing us, Chichu. You're killing us. <laughs> so anyway. We, we, we have, we, by the way, with, with, you know, with all honesty, and, I, and this is, please don't say this outside this room, we need to go back and do, redo 101, and, and we need to redo 102. I'm it's not, happening. yes. <laughs> I don't know when yet, because I'm, I'm the only, I'm the whole video team right now. But, it's <laughs> but we, but when we did 101, we didn't know what the fuck we were doing. <laughs> it was just like, or Dean, let's do this. Yeah, yeah. And we did like three, I don't know if you've ever seen the, uh, the beginning. You weren't even around then, Chichu, were you? Those things were brutal. The first two or three were brutal, and we threw them out. And, uh, and the third one was passable, and we put it out to see what would happen, and it just took off. Um, and if we look at it now, I, you almost can't look at it. When you see 103, it's going to be so much better. It is so much better. And we need to go back and redo 101 now, and we need to redo 102, because we learn so much. I mean, the, you know, for instance, what people remember, you know what people remember more than anything else from 101? The case study video. The case study video on what? No. The, what? the case study videos. <laughs> the case study videos they love, that's not the number one thing. Yeah. No, I believe it or not, the thing that got the most views was something else. The Giovanni? Yeah, it was a Lamborghini and the Giovanni example. 
people remember that all the time. Uh, and, and it's really interesting, you know, and they'll come up and say, I didn't take the Volvo. It's like, <laughs> good. <laughs> you, maybe you should have gotten a Volvo and not the Lamborghini. That's not the point. <laughs> but these little exercises and little games within it, hugely important, hugely important. When you look at 103, um, it is going to have a lot more of that, these little kind of games within it. And, you know, you have to make a choice. What do you do here? And when you think of 101, we were just talking at you, right? And it was, we could do a lot better than that. Is that right, Bootsy? Is, how's 103 coming along? Uh, I am going to get back on it as soon as I'm done filming that. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a lot more, you're, you're going to put a lot more gaming into it, right? They have to make decisions, and here's, yeah. And that's the workbook that I'm going through. So uh, this is a little bit of a off point. But I think we can make the MOOC much, much better, and we will. And when we do, I think you're going to see that more people will be engaged and they'll stay with it. It's still, I still think it's the number one class for people buying certificates on edX. Is that right? Not anymore, because we came out with the MicroMasters for with the supply, supply chain class. OK. Um, so that's overtaken. OK. Well, we'll crush them. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, but it was, but just to put it in perspective, even though we know that it could be a lot better, it still was the number one class for people getting certificates on, on, on edX, I don't know whether it was edX, I should say MITx, right? MITx. Yeah, I don't know whether it was for edX. Well, depends on how you define it, is it like total number of certificates or just yeah. percentage of certificates divided by enrollment? Oh, is that what it was? I just thought it was number of certificates. The, uh, we had the number of certificates? Anyway, this is just a, the, the, the point is, this is we're going back and forth here is just to get the facts right. But the mega point is, the, the meta point is, is that this was very, very popular and we didn't even do, I don't think we did as good a job as we could. Yes? Did you guys offer like Amazon credits or something? Yes. Oh. Yeah, yes. So that, so that, in, that incentive, um, that, I, I, that helped. But that's an in-kind type of thing, right? So, you, so you're, you, that's a good point. I don't know if they did that for other ones. No. Okay. Whatever we need to do to get them to take it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so we can do a good, better job on this. And then, and then once people do this, and we can follow their click stream and see who does a good job, and then we can look at the scores or whatever, and then we can invite people to an advanced MOOC. This is what people are often referred to as a SPOC, a special private online class, a SPOC. And so that is, the marginal cost down here for a MOOC is, almost, is essentially zero, right? Essentially zero. But a SPOC would be, you know, we're going to have these certain things at certain times, there's higher touch, you might have and, you know, Andrew or other TAs that would help you out on it, there would be, the marginal cost of this might be $25 or something. It might be, it might be, this is special private online class, course, I'm sorry, course, a class. So you would have to do well and then you would be invited to go into this next one. So even if it's $30, you might go from 100,000 here to 10,000 there and you're still educating people in a very, very efficient way. Has anybody taken a SPOC here? Yes, Renee, what's it like? Um, well, I use them in my class yes. uh, every semester. And uh, it, it's, it's wonderful because you can pace it the way that you, you can customize the pacing. Yeah. So students, my students over 15 weeks, they get stalled in certain steps. So, so you have 15 weeks. And it's it's paced, like these other ones are not paced. What what other differences are there? So the, that allows the students to move at their own pace. Yeah. Like individually, the teams, or if they're working you know, on their own, so the teams that are working you know very very quickly can move through it at their own pace. And right. They get stuck. They can stay. You know, and, and it helps me to tailor my class uh -huh. to their performance. Mm -hmm. So what you have here is that they have 15 weeks in which to do it. Is there a minimum time they have to get through, you know, lesson one? Mm -hmm. yeah. Is, is that? Yeah. So just to make sure that there's not 
Uh, by the way, I haven't done a Spock. This is all conceptual to me, so this is very interesting. Yeah, there's, uh, yeah, there's, there are deadlines for them to move mm -hmm. forward. So there's a forcing function that you have to reach, you know, this spot by, you know, by week, week two, right? Yeah. So the only thing we don't do is um, we, we don't have them submit, obviously, to MIT. We have them submit into our portal. Yeah. So we can, we can see when they submitted those assignments, and then we can identify the students who are falling behind. It actually yeah. makes your job so much easier. So, so do you have classes where everybody comes to it at the same time virtually? Yes. Yeah. So by the way, this doesn't have to be just through MIT. This could be somebody, this could be through Stanford, this could be through whatever, whatever university wants. It's the same kind of thought process here. Yes? I took a, a class through Coursera, yeah. uh, which was given by Vanderbilt yeah. on uh, video games and narrative. Yeah. And at the time when I found it, it felt very special and private and very different from other things on Coursera and on yeah. TEDx. And what was different was that it was a round table of uh, students that were selected by the, the instructor who was you know, at the center of the table, but uh, the, the, uh, the whole presentation was uh, listening to each of their opinions and at the same time looking at videos like some of the other uh, MOOCs, yeah. but it had a very special uh, and sort of uh, insider quality about it mm -hmm. that I knew. Interesting. And that's a, that's a cor uh, on Coursera? Uh, Coursera, Vanderbilt, uh, I can get the title of it. Mary, do you mind just getting, are, are you going to take notes on this, Chichu? I think this is, or someone should, just to fo follow up. Okay. It, or someone, Andrew? I don't know. Who the right? I'd be interested. Because I. Share it in the Slack group. Sure. The new Slack group. Mm -hmm. Great. Because this whole concept of moving to a Spock, allow, you know, a well designed Spock can be very, very powerful, yet you, you don't have to get to play, you don't have to get to the same place. You can teach people in a very extended, cheap fashion to them and you. And the way that I understood it as well is there are certain times where you come together and you have a, you have a lecture and then you have question and answers as well. So it's not, this is you're just, you're, you're a free electron roaming around the world on your own, right? Here, here you're, you, you're starting to build a community and you're getting a higher touch relationship but it's not that expensive, and it's not that hard for the instructor, and it's not that hard for the students. Is there an average duration for a course for it to be effective? I'm looking to Renee here. <laughs> uh, I, I, I teach in a traditional semester um, schedule, so it's 15 weeks. Mm -hmm. And um, so it, you know, I think it really depends on the population of students who come into your classroom. Some are ready to go. Mm -hmm. that perhaps some of you have done that helped you. So every team has a, a weakness. It could mm -hmm. be coding. It could be, you know, let's say it's UX design. Every team has at least one weakness. So we use the MOOCs to allow them to uh, cover that weakness, that gap on their teams. And so once we identify the weakness, we send them out to these MOOCs. Mm -hmm. Just a little bit more acclimated to that. We'll learn it very quickly, very cheaply, yeah. and they can perform better. Mm -hmm. We're going to come back to the later one about different types of uh, tiles when we get to the uh, entre entrepreneurship educators. But I would say the length of a course, I mean, that, t that very much depends on the topic, the expectation of wh what your goal is to teach. There, there are a lot of people who, who say, you can't teach entrepreneurship in one semester. You, 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 and, and you do a disservice to try to do that. You, 
so for someone to really try to do what we did in the boot camp, you should give them a full year to do that. And um, a full academic year, at least, to do that. But if you're, but if you're starting out, a, a course is better than where you were before. Yeah. <laughs> so the question is, is what milestone do you expect to reach that? So if, you're, if you want to convert a curious entrepreneur to a ready-to-go entrepreneur, I think you can definitely do that within a semester. I think you can actually potentially do that within a half semester, but certainly within a semester. To teach someone how to be a ready-to-go entrepreneur to achieve escape velocity, I don't believe you can do that in a semester. And, and what we do is we try to take them once through, and we'll get into details on this, and say, OK, now you sh you're sure you want to be a ready-to-go entrepreneur. You've kind of written your software once, throw it out, and now we're going to try to figure out how you write the software more rigorously. Yes? I was just wondering, well, this is just a question, but in the course last week, we spent a lot of time, um, not so much criticizing, but commenting about millennials and how they have different expectations and durations of jobs and how their employment works. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And how that applies to education as well, the, the expectations against the smaller bite-sized education from that generation of people as well. Yeah, so, um, so that's a really big, um, all right, so that's, did everyone hear what Nick said? This is a big thing. So the way education used to work, it used to, traditionally, educational institutions have tenure. So what you try to do is you try to achieve tenure. And once you get tenure, you have a job for life. And then basically you report to nobody. You're better than everybody else. <laughs> and this is inherent in an educational system. I'm, I'm, I'm going to tie back to yours, Nick. Don't worry, I'll get, I'll get to it within the hour. But, but, um, so you have a, uh, a tenure-based system, which works if you have a monopoly. And basically, educational institutions were monopolies because they were the only ones that could grant a credential, a credential. They're credential-granting institutions. If you, if you say, what is the product of a university, they'll say, our students. But in fact, academic institutions, especially, you know, that have tenure and all that for, it is a credential that they grant. They grant upon you a credential. So are you, are, which university are you at? Are you at a university? I'm not at a university now. So um, universities are very status oriented, very status oriented. Are you a PhD? Are you an MBA? You know, are you a professor? Are you an assistant professor? Are you tenured? Are you not tenured? All that kind of stuff. Because the credentials are incredibly important because that's ultimately the product that they produce. Now, in a world where credentials matter, that I have an MBA from Harvard Business School or I have a PhD from MIT, you know, from MIT, from, from HBS, these were tickets to, to success, right? The problem here is that as you go into the entrepreneurial world, it's a world that's anti-credential. Do you know what I mean by that? So let me, let me tell you what I mean by that is, the, the, you know, there's, a, there was a, there's a famous saying that the value of your startup is take the number of good engineers you have who know how to write code and multiply that by a million and then subtract the number of MBAs you have <laughs> multiplied by half, half a million. And that's how you figure out what the... And so it's a, it's a culture that glorifies the high school dropout, that they don't give a damn about where you went to school. They, they, they say that, and they, but it's, it's, it's a proudly, totally you know, merit-based, not credential-based. It, it's skill-based, right? And, 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 if you, and if you are good at something and you don't have a degree, that's even cooler than someone who does. And there's this, there's this uh, place called Flatiron down in New York now. There was just an article, I don't know if anybody saw that, in the Wall Street Journal. Was it the Wall Street Journal uh, on Friday? And they were talking about it. They don't grant credentials. They just teach you how to do something, and then they invite Google and all these other people in, and they hire them because they have skills. They don't need to give them credentials. They don't give out credentials. So in this world, you have an institution that has been built up for a monopoly, and that monopoly has just been destroyed. 
and their monopoly was based on credentials. So universities still look to this, lean back on this, well, you don't have a credential. And they say, I don't give a shit. <laughs> um, so our competition is not, you know, someone going and getting a credential from another school. Our competition is Y Combinator, it's Techstars, it's dropping out, it's going to Peter Thiel Fellowship. Those are the things, if they think they can get more value for their dollar, the millennials, and I, I don't know what a millennial is, by the way. This is a very ambiguous term. Well, it's like from 81 to I think like 2000. Yeah, I know, but someone who's born in 81 is profoundly different than someone who's born in 2000. Yeah. I mean, I know they're all pain in the ass, but they're, all, but they're <laughs> completely different. <laughs> Do we have millennials here? Look at that. I think so. Yeah, you think so. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, no, enough about me. What do you think about me? <laughs> <laughs> That's the millennial approach. <laughs> um, well, it's better than the Gen X approach for some of us. It was like we were just always thinking about everyone else, and then when we had to start to think about ourselves, it's like, fuck, <laughs> this is really hard. Could you watch your language in this classroom? I'm, I'm made by example. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. These criminals come over from Australia and they... <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, so, uh, so to your question is, not only is this a problem for an institution, they don't know what to do. They're like, I, I, I tell people at MIT, I go, do you realize I don't care? We're not going to lose people to these other places. What we're losing is people dropping out because they don't, because we're, if we don't, it's gone from a credential-based world where, the, where you could have people who, who didn't care to now it's value-based. We need to deliver value every day or students will drop out. I just had one drop out. And since they drop, he's not, quote, leave, you know. He got into Y Combinator, his company's taking off, he's not coming back, right? The other thing is, the other thing from this is going from a credential-based environment Uh, to a value-based environment, value-based educational environment is, is the first part of it. The second part of it, in that world where you don't have a monopoly, so Sally comes in and she's, she, so she's in, I'm, I'm her law school professor and, and advisor, and she comes in and says, Bill, I want a class on torts. Do you know what torts are? Good, because I don't know what they are. Um, <laughs> has something to do with law. Rules. It, rules. Isn't it rules? That's the easiest way to no, describe it. It's something to do with law. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's something to do with law. It's very boring, and we're not going to pay any attention to it. But, but if, 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 if Sally was a lawyer at Harvard Law, if she was a student at Harvard Law School, she came and said, Bill, I want to learn about torts. I would say, yes, yes, good, Sally. Let's learn about torts. <laughs> let me tell you, there's a class. You know, there's a class. Let me take a look here. There's a class next, next October. There's a class you can take in it. And she'd say, well, thank you very much. Tally-ho, I'll take it next, uh, you know, October. And because torts aren't going to change between now and uh, October. And she's going to be at graduate school for three years. And she's just going to learn about torts in those three years. Now, if Sally is an entrepreneur and she comes into my office and says, Bill, I want to learn how to raise money. And I go, oh, good, good, Sally. Very good. <laughs> There's a class next October. Uh, actually, it's not taught October. It's taught in January because the, because the professor's on sabbatical. <laughs> how does that sound? You'll learn how to finance. W what would you say? I'd say, it's too late. Yeah, she'd say, what? I need to know now. You're going to explain to me now how to do that. I got Brad Feld's book here, and I need to know how to do this. You need to tell me how to raise money now because it's just in time education as opposed to, you know, kind of this just wait and be patient because you have no other, no other alternative. And I'm making it a little stark, but this is a dramatic change. And the moment you have a system that was built with tenure in a monopoly, and I'm not, you know, I'm not condemning tenure completely here, um, but it, 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 it works beautifully, it doesn't work beautifully. It, 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 it's, it's a good product map to a demand where you have a monopoly and you have this kind of situation. It does not work very well when it's value-based and credential-based and it changes. 
the nature of fundraising could be one way today, and then 12 months <laughs> from now, we could have crowdsource, crowdsource funding being a dominant type of way. And it's, it's, it's dynamic, it's, it's value-based, it's just in time, and it's dynamic. And that is something that universities are not built for, are not built for, historically. How did you drag me into that? Because that wasn't part of this whole presentation. <laughs> no wonder they kicked you out of the European Union. <laughs> All right. So, so this uh, concept of a SPOC, which is not completely well defined, but which is bad news and good news, it leaves us the ability to formulate what it is, but there's great opportunity here to go from what we already know to this kind of self-paced move people through here. And when you do this, you still have the clickstream data. So now we can make data-driven decisions at an individual level to say, you know, as, as, as Renee said, this group is not doing well. Maybe they should take this other MOOC. You know, they're having t problems. They need to take Noam Wasserman's class and figure out how to get along better. Uh, they, they seem to be faltering in how to do primary market research. They should take Elaine Chen's, you know, class. So, but, it, but this isn't that expensive and it's geographically distributed. So that's wonderful. But the problem is, is that I, I still believe um, that you can't teach entrepreneurship just through electrons. You have to, you know, getting together with people and having that personal interaction for most of it is incredibly important. I think the combination is very powerful. That if you have people that you meet and then you can do email and then you can do Skype, all of a sudden that relationship is much deeper. Yes? The division will be like 50 and 50 percent or you would rather have more human interaction than through technology? So, so I, think it, I think it varies. My, the, well, let me just say I, I don't have, um, I'm going to give you my perspective. We haven't done this, but I think at the beginning, when you, when you first get to know someone, you can maybe start you know, electronically and filter them out. But then there's this part where you need to, I think you meet people, and then you need less and less of it after, after you meet them. We were just talking about this for a, um, talking with someone, they were, they were looking to architect an accelerator. And they said, what if we have people come in two days a week? It, will we have an effective accelerator? And my take is absolutely not. You won't have an effective, because you'll never build the pack. If people just come in two days a week, they're still basically doing their other job. And so I said, you need full immersion for at least 30 days, 60 days. And then maybe you could go to two days a week. Because if we all live with each other in an intense way for, you've just done it for a week and th think how great that was. You could never recreate that online. You could never create that. But after you've done that now, now you can go to the electronic and these other means and you can have much f less frequent. But I think to really get to know someone, you have to initially up front make the investment to get to know them. That would be my um, um, e educated opinion, not scientific at this point. But what I'm going to do here is say that we, we, if we start out with hundreds of thousands here, we can go to 10,000 there. Only 1,000 might be go to the boot camp. Only 1,000, all right? Um, and then of those 1,000, those are kind of the creme de la creme. That, that's kind of like what you have done here at, at the boot camp. And, but then of those 1,000, then only 100 would go to the national boot camp. And then of those 100, you know, 10 would go to, to, to MIT, to the global boot camp, or, or wherever it is. It doesn't have to be at MIT. But that would be, this is how, and so you'd say, well, you're still only educating a small number of people. Does this make sense to everyone right now? And, and, and there is not a, there's not a lot of doubt in my mind that this would work. Why? Because we have done this and we have done the top one. Now we just have to fill in between. This is a crate and barrel. Anyone who lives in the United States, you know crate and barrel? They put one store here, and they put another store here, and then they just fill it in between. <laughs> Questions, thoughts, comments? I would encourage you to poke holes in this. I've done this to other people, and they go, it's great. It's like, no, that's not the point. The point is, like, what's, what can we do? Yes, David, one right? That, one thing I like about it is that when we did a lot of micro-businesses, one of the things that we found... What, what, what countries? 
Uh, we did in 25, so all of North Africa, some Southeast Asia, some the Mediterranean, some Central Asia, so I could list them all too. Thank you. Okay, so nor North Africa, so to me that's a, you know, kind of a cr pretty crazy place, right? Yeah. Middle yeah. East. Um, Middle East. Lebanon. Yeah, Jakarta, that's. Jakarta, Indonesia, Myanmar. Yeah. Uh, Bangladesh. Those, so, 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 so those are more bottoms up yes, uh, yes. places. So there's a lot of micro stuff. But what we found was, I mean, we tested for entrepreneurship to some degree, and I know there's not a gene, but we found that the tenacity is a keep on going, it's the kind yeah. of thinking. And, but what we found was when we started the companies and we were very successful in sustainability rate, but the other thing that we found is about 10% of our students were growth oriented entrepreneurs. Uh -huh. And so we, we ended up, looking at some different things that, you know, 10% were growth oriented and, you know, 10 to 20% were really entrepreneurs that wanted to start a business, but they were more management oriented. So we ended up with, you know, about 25% total that were management oriented. The other 85% of the population just wanted a job. And so we saw the same thing. The other, the other what? They just wanted a job. Did you say the other 95%? I said 85%. Okay. 10, 15, that, okay. So I, we're at MIT here. We like the numbers yeah. to add up. <laughs> <laughs> but we saw the same scaling. You know, we saw, you know, uh, the scaling where right. we got a smaller and smaller and smaller number yeah. that the top that were the growth-oriented entrepreneurs, and one of the things I would see with this model at the top are the thought leaders yeah. that are really creating the environment yeah. to keep all the rest of it moving forward. Yeah, so yeah. at the top, you get the thought leaders that, yeah. that create the community. Did everyone get that? That's what we call the tip of the spear. It's like, you know, I don't, if you've ever been to a dog track, which hopefully you haven't been, um, they race dogs, but the dogs don't go very fast unless they put a fake rabbit in front of them. When they put a fake rabbit in front of them, these dogs go super fast trying to catch this rabbit, which they'll never catch because it's a mechanical rabbit. Um, but the point is those are the, the rabbit, those are the tip of the spear, so to speak, that people will start following them and they'll create that. I, this, this is very interesting. We'll come, I, I want to come back to that later. It's David, right? Mike. Mike, the artist formerly known as David. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I have a question. Yes. There is a book called Peak, right? Peak. Peak. What, what is your name, by the way? I'm going to try to. Ray Rosales. Ray. Where are you from? Canada. OK. Oh, yeah, Canada. <laughs> <laughs> you talked about. You should apologize then. <laughs> 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 Yeah. to really bring out the best, to be more purposeful in training entrepreneurs on each level. So my, my take is, is that, you, you, we'll, ha we'll have here, is that you should have a PR campaign to say that it's good to be an entrepreneur and all that, but entrepreneurs have to self-select. They have to self-select. As I always say, the bird must sing from within. You cannot tell someone they have to be an entrepreneur. Do you have, do you have kids, right? Have, yeah. yeah. 11 and 5. Yeah. Can, can you make them do something? No. no. <laughs> yeah. I have four kids, and I want them to play basketball. And I don't know what it's like in Canada, but in the United States, as soon as the parent wants a kid to do something, they do not do it. Uh, <laughs> so, and there's nothing I could do. I could provide them with the greatest coaches in the world to play basketball. Um, I, could do, I could take them to places. I could give them all. They didn't want to, so it didn't matter. So if, if the bird must sing from within, if, the, if they don't want to be entrepreneurs, they can't. So you give them the opportunity, you try to inspire them, then you get them on here. And that's the beautiful thing here, is you just put it out there and see if they do it. And then you check the click stream and you find out how ambitious they are. And are they one of these tip of the spear ones, the growth oriented? Um, so this stuff in between, makes perfect sense to me to be doable. We just need to get a commitment to do it. We need to, I think, flesh out the SPOC and we need additional content to be able to do it. But you, you will need resources to be able to do these things beyond what MIT can provide. So we're talking to a region about this and said, you know, we can help you with provide the platform, the, 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 the initial courses, and we can provide the top. But in between that, you need to do those things, you know. You need to be able to provide the residential boot camps. You need to provide mentors there who localize the content. And that's the next 
That's the next part of this, okay? Oh, by the way, here's the thing here. People say, well, you only get five students. How is this educating people at mass? And what I'm going to come back to here is that if you have 100,000 people take the cla class in a region, you will fundamentally change the capability of that region, even if they never go to the MOOC, <laughs> the advanced MOOC, even if they never get to the boot camp. They have now been infected and they know what it is. And I see this all the time. There are tons of people. I, should, I, I, I wish I saved the emails. Um, of people who've taken the MOOC and they never came to the boot camp and stuff just happens in their life. Their life changes. So that we get 100,000 people here with the hope that they could go to MIT and they don't go to MIT, that doesn't, I'm not phased about that. We have hopefully changed 10,000 of those people forever or maybe more, maybe less, I don't know. But the carrot out there to be able to come is a powerful carrot and to keep they ran the race, they got in shape, and now they do other things. You don't have to go to the top here to be a great entrepreneur. What we're trying to do is find those people out there. There's this term now that it's coming about, it's called inclusive entrepreneurship. Inclusive entrepreneurship. Where is the next great entrepreneur? Is a great entrepreneur for the United States sitting in a place that we know? And the answer is, it is very, very unlikely. You know, there was once upon a time, there was a, um, a, a, a German Catholic woman in Wisconsin, and she had a, an affair with a Syrian Muslim in, 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 in Wisconsin, and they had a kid out of wedlock. And that kid was put up for adoption. And does, does anyone know who that kid is? Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs, right? And you can see this over and over again, Sam Zell. How do we find these people? We have to be inclusive to the entire society. We have to have a frictionless way to give them a chance to get into it. And that's what the point of this whole thing is. And once, we, once they get in, then we can identify them in this very merit-based way, the click streams, and then have them go forward. Yes? Uh, so my name is Song Wan. Yes. Uh, I have a, Where are you from? Uh, from South Korea, but living in Australia now. Beautiful. Yes. So I have a clarifying question. So each stage represents different persona. So I guess MOOC would be a uh, uh, curious persona, and then the next level is more ready to go. I mean, yeah. you know, maybe top level. Yeah, I think you would have multiple personas going through here, okay. right? And I think some of them would take it and go off, okay. you know, and say, I got what I needed. Okay. Um, so, yeah, sorry, go so ahead. So two, two questions on that, right? So first thing, how do you know um, the MOOC makes impact to those uh, hundreds, thousands, Great question. I mean, that's, um, this is one of, th the question of assessment, do we really make people better entrepreneurs? Or are they already good entrepreneurs and they just, we found them, right? This is the argument of Y, y Combinator. The, you know, people say Y Combinator doesn't teach people to be entrepreneurs. All they do is they just go around the entire world and they find them, they bring them to uh, Silicon Valley, they polish them up and they show people who they are. Did they teach them anything over that time period? And it's very unclear whether they did or did not. Okay. So how do you assess that you improve their skills from the beginning until the end? That's the essence of education. Okay. Do you know what I mean? Like there's selection bias. Does Harvard teach people how to be great? Does MIT teach people? That's unclear because they get great people who already come to Harvard and, and MIT. And then when they come out, they can say, Let's see, we were great. When in fact, it was the input that they got in how, how good did they make them once they were here for four years? Yep. That's the whole point of education, assessment. Exactly. So that, that comes down to my second question. So that's, uh, did I sufficiently not answer your first question? Uh, you answered 50%. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the answer is that the whole area of assessment is one that we're looking at, and, there's, and I'll show you a website uh, to, to show people whether something's effective or not, or whether it's just storytelling and people are inspired and they run off and go do it, which you could argue is effective, right? So the second question is, if you look at the um, effectiveness and efficiency of each um, you know, programs, yeah. um, and if you look at the bottom of the pyramid, I think that that's the least productive um, in a way that if you look at the input versus output, you have um, 10, you know, 100,000 people coming in, 
uh, yeah. personalized, maybe, yeah. you know, curious people, and yeah. a couple yeah. of them just drop out. I found that, oh, you know, entrepreneurship is not for me. Maybe, uh, I don't know, 100 people, you know, 10% will actually find it useful. Yeah. Then uh, would you say that's, you know, would you still say that's that's the good way to approach? I mean, what about you know we have some filtering system uh, um, you know underneath the MOOCs and yeah. so that we increase the you know productivity that way. Yeah. So I would great question. I would I would I would argue that first of all, are you are you a real um, academic professor? Uh, no, I'm a I'm a consultant. Ah, okay. So we need some real people who do data analysis of this stuff. Because, I don't, first of all, I think that many different personas will take this. And that's OK. And, and, and as an educational institution, we want to educate people about entrepreneurship. What it is, not what, what we want to give them a real education as to what it is. If they learn what it is and they decide not to do that, is that successful? If you're an educator, that is successful. If I teach you something and you decide you, you know, now know what it is, you have increased knowledge, and you decide not to do it, that in fact is, is, is valid education. Because I don't now, I don't sit here and say, Jesus, I, do, uh, should I be a lawyer, should I not be a lawyer? I now know what it is, and I don't want to do it. Now I, I can focus on the things I do want to do. Yes? I, I'll come back and answer your question. I didn't answer it. Yes. So what I'm interested in with this pyramid, you're getting them up the ladder and the higher performers are moving higher up, but, but the whole kind of ecosystem around it is yeah. missing. And I'm yeah. curious to see, like, how, at what stages and where does it do you see people in these programs start to connect with, with the environment where they want to you know, practice or engage or yeah. join our entrepreneurial communities? So let me, uh, so, so. Let me tie the two questions together is because I think you're going, to have, you're going to have the curious entrepreneur, which is an unsteady state. Then you're going to have the ready-to-go entrepreneur, which everybody wants to focus on. But you're also going to have the corporate entrepreneur who, 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 who's going to learn how to be an entrepreneur in a large organization and not start their own. In other words, they're going to become much more innovative. And then you're going to have what's called the entrepreneurship amplifier. Have you heard these terms before? Okay. What? He's planted a seed in our pathway thing. To yeah. So, so, so the curious entrepreneur is someone who doesn't quite know what it is, and they this unsteady state. I think I want to be an entrepreneur, but I don't know what it is. So either once they learn what it is, they are going to decide I want to be an entrepreneur, a ready-to-go entrepreneur, a corporate entrepreneur, an, an entrepreneurship amplifier, or I don't want to be. Ed, they now education gives them the ability to take this and do this, uh, make that decision. All right. So I want I want to go be a uh, a, a, a government drone. All right. All right. So if they go over here, this is someone who wants to start their own kind of company. They want to, and they might not do it right away. They might be what we call ready to go minus one. They say, I want to start my own company, but the best thing I can do is I can go work at HubSpot. But I know that ultimately I want to take control of my own destiny and start my own company. Okay? So this is the one everybody talks about. This is your startup entrepreneur. All right? Well, we're going to talk about this. This person can get skills from this and become an entrepreneur within a larger organization. And this is a huge demand, a huge demand. This is what, I, I could spend all my time doing this, by the way. This is what, this is what Eric Ries does, from, you know, the guy who did Lean Start, that's what he gets, he makes his money. He gets paid $50,000 a day to go talk to large companies about how to be more entrepreneurial. This is where Jeffrey Moore is now. This is where the money, big money is, because these people have lots of money and they don't know what to do with it. So they need to, they need to become more innovative and they look at entrepreneurs and say, we need some of that in our organization. So these are people who actually will start new organizations within bigger organizations. Okay, so, so Margaret, to your question, 
This is a group that we found when we surveyed our, 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 our students. And this is a really, really interesting person. This is called the Entrepreneurship Amplifier. This is someone who actually doesn't want to be an entrepreneur. They don't want to start a new organization. You say, why are they up there? Because it's Esteban Lubinsky, who comes from Quito, Ecuador. His family has a business, and he wants to take that business to a whole nother level. And he knows that he doesn't have to start a new company, but to do that, he needs to harness the power of entrepreneurs and create some entrepreneurs within his own company. So he has to figure out, how do you build an ecosystem? This, these are the ecosystem builders that you're looking at. And I'm going to show you that their needs overlap heavily with what we're doing, what we're going to be talking about here to train this person. And I didn't understand this at first at all, at all. And these people having them around. So in, our, in, our, in my, my classes today, this is about 50% of the people. And it might even be more. Um, this might be 20%. This is 10 to 15%. This is 10 to 15%. So that's, that's ballpark. All right? So um, this, this can be, but th this is the biggest one. So this, this is by far the biggest one. They come in. But at, at the end of the class, you've got to decide what you want to do unless you've got a big trust fund and you don't have to decide in life what you want to do. You can be Kim Kardashian or <laughs> Paris Hilton, right? And, and, but once you go over here, this, this is really interesting. To, to your point, Margaret, is, um, and I always, uh, um, the ready-to-go entrepreneur, we all understand. This one, you understand. You're saying, why is this one important? And, and uh, I have a lot of students who want to go, so Devin Cook actually was, my, as I'll, I'll show you later, was the persona here. She took entrepreneurship class and she said, I like this stuff, but I'm not going to do this and I'm not going to do that. What I want to do is go back to my home state of Maine and I want to be the one in government that helps create entrepreneurship there. That's hugely important, hugely important. That's creating an ecosystem. And this became really clear when I was in uh, Scotland and I was presenting to the faculty of Strathclyde University and I said, our job is to teach people how to fish, not to catch a fish. And Samuel was from Kenya and he said, that's great, but let me tell you a story. There was once a time where someone came in and told us that exact story, we're going to teach you how to fish, not to catch a fish. And they did a great job teaching us how to fish. And then we fished the lake in Kenya, and there were no fish left. And, it's a, and, and it, it, we overfished it, and we basically wiped the lake out. <laughs> and so you, you know, teaching people how to build a sustainable ecosystem for, entrepreneur, for, for fishing and for entrepreneurship that's kind of the role of this, and how do you increase the pie as well? So having these people around is really, really important. So where do media influences in the media space for entrepreneurship fit in that? Is this in this entrepreneurship aspect? Well, that, it's interesting, because I think that a lot of times governments ask me, well, well what should we do? You know, should we build an accelerator? I think one of the things that people should do is create a PR campaign to make entrepreneurship better understood. So that when you go to certain places in the world, I don't know what it is in, in, in yours, but there's a fundamental misun misunderstanding of what entrepreneurship is. So if you go to the you know, Mediterranean area, you go to um, Sevilla, Spain. If you say, uh, people who are entrepreneurs don't say they're entrepreneurs because entrepreneurship means you're exploiting other people. I, I, entrepreneurship is, I'm kind of a hustler. I, I take advantage of other people as opposed to, I'm growing this, I'm bringing economic development. Mm -hmm. So the PR campaign to explain what entrepreneurship is and what's not, I think is important. And that's in part what happens here. You drive people into the MOOC and then they understand, oh, this is what it is. We create value for our customers. We don't steal money from them. You know, it, it's, it's, we create good jobs. And by the way, these entrepreneurs sometimes bring technology to the bottom of the pyramid in Africa. They, uh, in India, they, they produce jobs for women in, in, in Africa. They do all these good things. Those are entrepreneurs. I, didn't, I never understood that. So to me, that's the PR. So did I answer your question, Margaret? Yes, thank you. Did I answer your question? Yes, sir. Sung? Sung Wan. Sung Wan. Yes. OK. So this is, I think this is really important here. And a lot of these people here, it's not just those five up there. Those five are going to be very important, and we've invested a lot of money in it. I think you're infecting 
lots of people here, and a Steve Jobs could well come from here and say, I got it. I got everything I need. Just get out of the way. I, I don't need to go with the pack anymore. And this is this, is this kind of scouring the, the, the countryside and giving them the frictionless opportunity at no cost. And by the way, I think this is absolutely the way. We don't have, do we, we don't have anyone from the Middle East here, do we? Yeah, this is what they have to do in the Middle East. Um, and, and that's, so let's go to the second triangle. The second triangle is the customization one. And this is where, you know, if, if there's a team that does this, and this is what we're working with, with regions, then, then you have to think about, is it in the right language? Can we get case studies that are customized for Scotland, for Saudi Arabia, for, you know, Malaysia? Um, and then put a PR campaign together to get people out, to say entrepreneurship is fine, you try this. You know, have people saying good things about it. To drive people to this. But that's basically all they have to do at this point. It's not a lot. As you go to the advanced MOOC, the teachers, mentors, and more localized content becomes much more important there. And then as we move up there, the residential boot camp, I would argue, should use the local academic institutions that already exist. The infrastructure already exists for these places. There are actually people out there who want to do it. They just need to be um, included in this and train properly and say, this is the program. Do you want to join the program? Now, some of them say, no, 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 no. We don't want to take a program from, you know, the Americans. They, they're know-it-alls. Well, but that's kind of this international program. You can contribute to it. Um, but if you, by the way, if you don't, we're going to go to the other university and we're going to work with them or we're going to work with somebody else. And ultimately, then it, they say, well, I don't want to get left behind because entrepreneurship is going to happen. And they can try to craft their own entrepreneurship at one, you know, Australian university. But if all of a sudden another one has the one, the same language that everybody else is speaking, they're going to get overwhelmed and left behind. So the idea here is to try to build a critical mass. So you see the local institutions using the infrastructure, the national boot camp is even more so. And then when they go to MIT, um, it's, it's the, you know, actually they do less, but then those people are going to be role models and those people are going to come back in and feed, I'm sorry, the people who go, um, oh, I'm sorry, I should read my own slides, which I didn't last night. Um, it's not only the role models, because these role models are the tip of the spear. W what did you call them? Um, the role, the, yeah, the role models, they're the tip of the spear, they're the, the mechanical the rabbit. The thought leaders. Thought leaders, thought leaders. Yeah, so those are the people that they look, uh, you look at them and say, yes, I can do it. If, if Creedy can do it, God damn it, I can do it. He was sitting here the other day next to me, right? They're the inspirational figures from their own society. And then it's important that those, those um, institutions, be they government, academic, cultivate a relationship with the MITs, with the Stanfords, with whoever it is, so that they have that as well. Now, the, what's the role of a place like an MIT? A place like a, a role of an MIT is certainly to provide content lower, but it's also to be the convening platform, oops, it's to be the convening platform that opens it up to a whole new world of opportunity. If you're just trying to understand entrepreneurship and you're in Brisbane, you know, it's really hard. When you come here, all of a sudden you see all this opportunity, you see all these other people in the room, it just opens everything up for you. And that's the point of MIT is, it's the convening platform to bring people together. It's kind of what London used to be before Brexit. <laughs> so, by the way, the better graph was, I'm sorry, I'm not, that, here it is here, you see the, the top triangle, the, the cloud, the external connections and opening up the whole world to you. Through, through MIT. It's not just MIT, it's the whole world. All right, so what, what, what my, uh, my strong recommendation is you don't just do this once. You do this every year. It's a process. And you tell people, hey, make it on. Next year, you could go to the, the global boot camp. You put a carrot out there for them to go after it. And every year as they go through that, you get a new crop. You maybe get update the cases. And the people who are the, um, the thought leaders now come back and they build this triangle over here. Because this triangle will start very small. It will start very small and then it will get bigger and bigger over time as those thought leaders go back. When you go back to your regions, you will be building up that triangle 
for your region. Now, and, and this gives you a way to say, how, what, what should I build up? Should I just go and teach this stuff to five people, 10 people, 20 people, 1,000 people? My argument would be we teach it to, to tens of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people, um, and we not keep reinventing it. So let me, let, me, let, me, um, let me try to stop here for a second if I can. Yes? Can I give a, Mike. A, an example of practical, looking at it from another perspective, how we've seen this? Yes, please. We've dealt, we built a couple global networks and we talked about five things to build a global network or a decentralized viral growth network, because that's what you're really trying to do is go decentralized. Decentral, right? de there's a name for this, decentralized viral growth. Viral growth. Catalytic leaders, that's you. Operational champions. Leaders. Operational champions. A common DNA. Operational champions. Yeah. Three, the common DNA. Yeah. Four is the common framework. Yeah. And five is the collaboration vehicles. Common framework. And collaboration vehicles. Right. So what happens is catalytic leaders get this idea and they start talking about it. Wait, col collaboration vehicles? Vehicles or venues. Vehicles, vehicles, and venues. So you get catalytic leaders to start. Wait, wait let me just let me just process this. Okay. So I would say common framework and language, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. So when a, a movement begins, you have these catalytic leaders talking about it all over the place. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Talking. And somewhere along the line, they start marrying up with operational champions. Yeah. They marry up because they have a common DNA, and they're interested in the same thing. And we see the whole entrepreneurship innovation thing. Uh, there's a common DNA emerging. But what happens in the... I, I would argue that if you don't have a common DNA, this will... This will That's correct. Then, yeah. it will... It will yeah. 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 And, and it has to start with a relationship, a commitment between those first two. Because if yeah. you don't get a relational commitment, then you can't get to the next steps. A lot of people start to try to start with steps four and five, yeah. but they don't have a committed relationship in steps one and two. Yeah. So what happens is when the movement starts gaining momentum, the operational champions start creating the common framework. Yeah. Yeah. The language <coughs> yes. that allows collaboration. If you don't have common framework and language, you can't yeah. collaborate. Yeah. So once the operational champions start creating the common framework, then what happens is collaboration begins to occur, and you see collaboration on two different levels. You see a mobilization collaboration, and you see an, an operational collaboration. Yeah. The mobilization <coughs> collaboration happens early because everybody's talking about it. So people have events. Everybody has events around innovation and entrepreneurship and all these activities yeah. occur, but everybody walks out of the events and nobody does anything. Yeah, you call that mobility? What did you call it? Mobilization. Mobilization, right? Mobilization events. It's part of the collaboration. But yeah. when the operational champions start creating the common framework, you start to see operational collaboration. Yeah. And that's where things start to go viral. Yeah. And so what you're creating here, Plus. or what I see, is you're creating a common framework that is allowing these operational champions in other regions at another level to take what you built and then go viral with it. So they start to take it and run with it on their own. So when I look at these four things that you have over here on the right, the, um, the amplifier in, in the ecosystem, the operational Wait, 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 what, 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 what four things? These? Yeah. When you look at did you did you sleep at a Holiday Inn last night? <laughs> I stay there pretty regular. Um, the amplifier, because I look at the other kinds of entrepreneurs, but the amplifier creates the ecosystem. Yeah. And over here, it's the operational champions at the highest level that are creating the ecosystem. That's the framework. Yeah. The global framework, and then it gets down. You know, some people have a global calling. Some people. Yeah. Have yeah, yeah. 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 Absolutely. Have a but it's the amplifiers that are the operational champions creating the framework. Yeah. So you guys are the global amplifier. Yeah. That's just. Is, that, is, there, is there a, 
Is there a book on this? What is, what is this? Yeah, that's great. Coming soon. Coming soon to Slack. <laughs> no, that's great. And I think that takes, because I know, I, I know instinctually that this will work. I don't have these frameworks to think, I don't have, you know, and, and you just kind of provided some with that. I know that this, I'm kind of coming at this bottoms up. And what you just said is that there's, you know, this is a repeatable <laughs> pattern. It is. Yeah. And I, I think that's, I, you know, and I think you could almost lay out here and say, who does, because if, if, if you don't have someone who does this, I would say, you know, what we're doing is, is, is this. Um, you know, academic institutions aren't really great at this, but we're, we have some of this. Um, we provide some of this, some of this, but, you know, if there's gaps, it's, gonna, it's not going to work, yeah. right? You yeah. mentioned something a minute ago with legends because you get into rites and rituals, heroes, role models, legends, which create the community. So yeah. as, the, as the top catalyst with MIT, you now have the ability as the amplifier to bring definition to the community yeah. through heroes, role models, rites and rituals, yeah. and things like that. And, and meeting regularly like once a year is critical because you, yeah. can't, you can't do it without face to face. Yeah. And that's the role of MIT is it's an honest broker. It's a nonprofit. It's, it's all these things. And it has a, it has a, a, a brand, a respect to it that, that gives it power. And, and, and yeah. Susan Hockfield, the previous president, always talked about that. We need to use this MIT as, as an honest broker convening platform. What are we doing to do that? What are we doing to do that? We don't have to invent this stuff. We need to bring people in. That's great. All right. Yeah, there's, there's something there. Can you write that up and get back to us on Friday? Yeah. He's very kindly helping us apply that to this yeah. work for MIT. I think it's great. I mean, I think it's a, it's a, it's a road map. It's amazing. Yeah. Because um, I'm just telling you what I see happening, and I don't have this lens in which to look at it. And, it, and, I, you know, and I did the 24 steps after having done like t multiple startups and failed, and it took a long time to come up with it. Um, all right, so this just goes back to the point that even if we push 1,000 people up there, 99,000 people might be the real gold in this whole thing here. <laughs> because that might be where Steve Jobs is. That might be where Sam Zell is. That might be where Larry Ellison is, the person who was kind of on the outside of society that wouldn't have gotten a chance otherwise, and they did. Um, so you, uh, sorry. So you, you get it. It's high quality entrepreneurship education at scale already successfully practiced at the bottom and the top at MIT. Um, to, the goal is to achieve scale that's never been done before, and it should be repeated over and over again. The, the, we were just talking about once a year. Because we've seen this with competitions. If you run competition once, all you do is you get the latent demand and you give them money. But if you run a competition year after year and people know that it's coming back, then they get ready for it and they skill up for it and they focus on that. And that's what the rhythm of it is very important. OK. So this is, this is the stuff I'm going to talk about uh, next time after lunch. So no, no, there's no clapping here. This is a teacher's. A, so I would love to have help. At, you know, we just did this in Scotland. And uh, here's the bad news is we just got Scotland to buy into this. And um, Andrew knows, we just, Scotland did a program called Scale Up, and they, they, they made this available to Scotland. And they did not have tens of thousands of people take it. <laughs> they, had, they had less than a few thousand people take it. And that's the issue that I'm wrestling with right now. Why did that happen? Why did that happen? And I think, you know, there's multiple reasons why it happened. I think one is, you know, there wasn't a big PR campaign. Two, they, they were getting free admission into a regional boot camp here. Uh, the regional boot camp. No, actually, it was a national boot camp. And many of them saw that they just didn't have a chance to do that. They were intimidated by the fact that it was MIT. We did, I did this with Noam Wasserman from Harvard Business School, who's now going to USC. I don't know if anybody knows Noam. But they felt that it wasn't reachable for them. So I think, and I think the other, you know, there are other factors. 
I think the, the MOOC needs to be redone. It needs to be redone and we need to have it such that it's, it's marketed to people, that it's very easy for them to take it. They felt that there was no, it was not frictionless. I have to spend 30 hours and I have a business? You're asking me to spend 30 hours? I can't spend 30 hours. We have to figure out a way. And someone was, who was the person who was up here talking? Where, where are you from, by the way? Where are you from? Where? Brazil. Brazil. You were talking about you can't ask people to take this huge commitment for education. You have to give them a little bits and, and kind of lead them on to it. And I think that's what we have. That's one, another issue we had here as well. But I don't know. I mean, this is all real time. I'm telling you it's, it's happening. But this, I totally believe, is where it's going to be. Some variant of this is where entrepreneurship education is going to be going in the future. Yes? Uh, <coughs> now, what's your name and where are you from? From where? From New York, but I'm originally from Chicago. Okay. Uh, so you're not really from New York. No. Uh, I've been there about 15 years. Yeah. Uh, so when, when I think about how uh, entrepreneurship to a lot of people uh, is both uh, about um, you know, uh, reading about uh, some of the you know, great stars that have made it and some of the yep. exciting areas we get to succeed. Yeah. But a lot of people at the same time will think about how difficult a path it is, yet if they just discovered it and, and maybe had a taste of it in some way, uh, might get some of the benefits that we all have in, in just starting on the path. And I think of uh, some of the analogies that I have uh, experienced in uh, my game development uh, or trying to plug in game <coughs> mechanics within a, like a business problem is there, there's this concept of scaffolding, you know, giving someone a taste yeah. of uh, the, the problem. Yeah. And then uh, one thing that is interesting is that once you feel the burn and the excitement of a, like a, a challenge, yeah. then all of a sudden, at least for me and some others that I've kind of pushed towards, you know, try this challenge, they feel the burn, and then they may want to like try something else. And so mm -hmm. I want to throw out there that uh, maybe there, there's a need to plug in somehow at the very beginning a little taste of uh, a massive online uh, yeah. course. Yeah, and there's and then you, and then you kind of lure them into the habit, lure lure them in, with um, yeah. I think I think that that that's another very good way to do it. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, Joey from. Joey from Canada. From China, grew up in New York. Yeah. And uh, living in Hong Kong. Okay. Okay. Um, I mean. Just on to uh, what he said is... Richard, uh, Richard from New York. Richard from New York. Who's really from Richard Chicago. Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> um, Being from New York, I, I know who it's a real New Yorker, and he's way too nice. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I live in Woodstock. <laughs> ah. so, no, a, a hippie. I'm, uh, I'm actually planning uh, a series of uh, basically half-day workshops yeah. at Tsinghua University. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And... Um, also in Hong Kong at some of the local high schools, just to basically introduce this. Yeah, yeah. Right, and just to talk about it, and then talk yeah. about some of the successes and and like you know the legends and and, and start to introduce. Yeah, that was the other thing he said. Yeah. Start to introduce this concept of hey, you can actually take anybody can take an MIT entrepreneurship course. Yeah. You know. You, you don't have to be special to take that. You can take the course, see if it's for you, yeah. and here's what we did in it, and you know, basically tell them the experience, yeah. tell them uh, here's what some of the success stories are coming out of it, yeah. and then they can decide for themselves, hey, is that something for me? Right? Yeah. And that's, that's a very low kind of uh, uh, barrier to entry, right? Yeah. So you don't have to sign up for the MOOC, you don't have to you know, sign up for the boot camp, you don't have to commit to hours and hours of uh, of, of something you just commit one afternoon first. Yeah, and they would and they and they would get like a little sticker or something. Yeah. yeah. Commit one afternoon and say, well, he, you know. Here's I the tried book. it. Yeah. Here's the online course. You know, why don't you go? Uh, and here's the uh, YouTube videos. Why don't you go and just find out about it? Here's what we did, and this is really cool. This is one of you know the most exciting things I've ever done in my life. And, yeah. And Give them those stories. Give them those wins. And I think and that that would behavior modif that would that would give the slight behavior modification 
that you need. Remember we're talking about Newton's first law. Yeah. Once they're moving, then oh, we got them moving. Now we can accelerate them, but the hard part is to get them moving. Yeah. And that's a, I, I just want to say this, then we'll break is, Legends is a, I've come to think is a very, very two-edged sword, a very, very much two-edged sword. When you run around and you talk about Mark Zuckerberg, better be really, really careful here. The, the, the good news about a, a, a legend and a role model is they're very, very powerful. The bad news is, is they're very, very powerful. <laughs> is that everybody thinks of Mark Zuckerberg, I can't be like Mark Zuckerberg, and, and Mark Zuckerberg was really young. No, no, so you have to be young to be an entrepreneur. And by the way, it has to work the first time. And then it takes off. And then you're in Hollywood and you have Sean Parker and all that kind of stuff. That is just, that is so not good to tell people about entrepreneurship. I, I really believe that the whole Mark Zuckerberg story has done more damage than good to entrepreneurship. They think like the first time you do it, you get it right, and then it just explodes in your dorm room, and you're actually just out trying to find women, you know, and it happens, you know, uh, and, and then you screw somebody, and this is the way it works, you know? Um, it's too powerful a story that it takes people in the wrong way. It's the wrong role model. Like, you know, I teach basketball. I would not tell someone to study LeBron James to be a basketball player because nobody else in the world has ever been built 6'9", built like a Greek god, and can jump higher than any person and can dribble better than any person. It's easy for LeBron James to be a star. The question is, take a, a Jeremy Lin. How did he become a star? That guy got knocked down 15 ways till Sunday. That's your role model. It's not Richard Branson. It's not, you know, I was partying in the Caribbean and I, I decided that I couldn't get home, so I had a jet. It's not, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not Bill Gates. And the problem is, is when you do role models like that, is they become very, very powerful things that people latch on to. And so I think you have to be really, really careful about that. I mean, um, and I have nothing against Mark Zuckerberg, although he was a spoiled little kid from Dobbs Ferry, but that's another <laughs> Um, but my point is that role models and legends, be very careful what you use because it will have a profound effect. <laughs> it's, it's, and it, and it, and it will, it's a tool that it will have them going that way. And you might say, no, no, I didn't want you to go that way. I wanted you to go over here. It's like, no, 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 you, you lit the fuse and it's going this way. Did you know who Jeremy Lin was, Rachel? No. How many of you have no idea who Jeremy Lin is? Do you know who Jeremy Lin is, Renee? Then you're supposed to. So, you don't know, you don't know. Do you know who Jeremy Lin is? No. Well, how many people know who Jeremy Lin is? Oh, good, half them, all right. Can we Google it then also? Yes. <laughs> it's all right, I just, my, the person I used to teach class with said, the students don't get your jokes, Bill. I said, that's all right, I think they're funny. Because <laughs> <laughs> I do too, but they don't understand what you're talking about. So anyway, the point is, is that he's this like, guy who worked really hard and finally got in, in to play professional basketball. But if he walked in this room, he wouldn't, he wouldn't be like seven feet tall. He wouldn't be like built like a Greek god. He'd just be like any one of us. What? The underdog. Yeah, no, he's just the everyman. He's not. It, it, it's not like he shouldn't be. Do you know who Jeremy Lin is, Joe? Oh, I'm a huge, huge, like, he's like one of my heroes. <laughs> really? Yeah. yeah. I used to watch him. I, his parents, his parents yeah, are like I, this I, big. I followed him from, you know, I mean, Oh, really? From Palo Alto? Yeah. Yeah, so why don't you have lunch with Rachel and explain to her all about it. <laughs> <laughs> but you get the analogy, right? No, my son has every one of his shirts from, you know, Harvard on. Oh. <laughs> you know, so. Okay. So after lunch, we're going to be seeing Jeremy Lin videos, uh, so don't, don't be late, all right? <laughs>